Hi, gang. I noticed that I must have accidentally pressed the pause button on recording today's class session. So I thought I'd take a few minutes here and recap what we talked about in class <clears throat> and put that up for the folks who weren't able to attend today. As I mentioned, one of the things that I enjoy doing is to try to think about the history of science and what counts as science. And in particular, it's not a good idea to think of science as advancing stage left and the forces of ignorance and superstition exiting stage right from the progress of science. And one of the things that is front of mind for a lot of us is the issue of vaccination. Now, I poked around a little bit on this maybe because I was curious from what some people I know had said. And it turns out that vaccination is an old idea that it got started in around 500 in China. And like so much of the struggles of vaccination, the worry there was smallpox, which was a terrible disease um, with a very high mortality rate. And in China at that time, the treatment was to take powdered scabs from someone who was infected and blow them up someone's nose as a way of exposing them. Now, if you read American history and the history of vaccination here, you find that that's going to be attributable to one gentleman. Let's see if we can bring up his Cotton Mather. Uh, Cotton Mather was a pilgrim. He lived in Boston. And the thing that started him down the road of variolization, variolization a fancy name for vaccination in those days, was he had purchased a slave called Anisimus. And yes, in Boston there was slavery. And yes, the pilgrims, the Puritans at that time, were slaveholders. Um, <clears throat> despite what we might think about their evident piety. And he had purchased a slave from Libya named Onesimus. And as part of the purchase, he inspected Onesimus for the presence of smallpox scabs. And he was surprised to find that he didn't have scabs. He had one smallpox scab on his arm. And he asked him, he said, have you had smallpox? And he said, oh, yes and no. I have not suffered from it, but where I come from in African medicine, there is a way to treat this. And he became curious about this. And the you know, history of Cotton Mather and his slave is kind of interesting. The slave was, as you might imagine, rather eager to buy his freedom and raised some money to hire another slave that Cotton Mather could have in his place. But Cotton Mather was not so eager to allow Onesimus out of his care, mainly because Onesimus did not convert to Cotton Mather's religion. Vaccination was controversial. Uh, there were people who were Puritans who thought that this violated the golden rule that you shouldn't do something to someone else that you wouldn't want done to you. And in this case, being done to you would have been getting you infected with this terrible disease. You can probably Google the story a bit more, but suffice it to say that controversies about vaccination went backwards and forwards in the early 1700s. And with some people thinking that plagues and epidemics were visitations from God, and to interfere with this would be to interfere with divine providence. Long story short, one community in Massachusetts elected to vaccinate, and another community, Boston, elected not to, and the number of deaths from the smallpox epidemic was quite markedly higher in Boston. Uh, you'd think that would have settled it, but it didn't. You know, the controversy continued on down through the revolutionary period where people such as Benjamin Franklin's brother who ran a newspaper lobbied against vaccination as an unnatural and unmedical way of treating people. How did Onesimus come to be vaccinated? Well, 
as so often happens, many of the innovations from China arrived in the West via trade. And from what we can tell, knowledge of vaccination, which started out in Sichuan and China, carried across to Constantinople, the Christians there. And from there, it spread across the Byzantine Empire and Northern Africa. The Turks, when they took Constantinople, did not allow vaccination to happen. So it was mainly a Christian thing. And I guess it's also worth noting that I found a few examples of exposure to smallpox in Wales and England and Scotland, where they would have children wear the clothes of someone who had smallpox as a way of exposing them to these things. Um, it's important to think that not necessarily, you know, Cotton Mather was not necessarily on the side of the angels. He was a fervent believer in witchcraft and figured quite heavily in the persecutions of the witches in the Salem witch trial. So let's come back and take a look at the lecture for today, where I can kind of go through some of the discussion that I had before. We had left off here talking about independent variables and dependent variables. And a control variable is any variable that we hold constant. Okay. Here we are. Okay. So where we left off at the last time was in talking about pre and post test designs, where we have people come in, we randomly assign them to treatment and control, and we give them a pretest, in this case, the verbal GRE score. We expose them to the treatment and then we watch how they perform later. And the reason that we're doing this is this gives us some information about what change should look like at the individual level. That is, our estimates of how many points people go up or down are adjusted for the rather large variation that happens in people in terms of their GRE scores. So this act of pretesting increases the precision of what we're looking at. It's also somewhat worthwhile mentioning that pretest and post-test designs also allow us to investigate the possibility of differential growth. That is, maybe this intervention is really particularly good for people who are lower in verbal GRE score. And those people who are higher maybe don't increase so much from this. Generally speaking, it's a lot easier to bring a low score up than it is to take a high score already and make it increase even more, sometimes due to the properties of the measurement. Sometimes that's just the way learning and change happens. It's kind of worthwhile to think a little bit about pre-post-test designs and this differential growth rate by considering that public television intervention of Sesame Street. Sesame Street was originally designed so that children from disadvantaged backgrounds, be it rural, be it racial, could be exposed to their letters and numbers. And in the pre-post design, however, what we found was that those kids who come from more advantaged backgrounds gained even more. So you know, this isn't necessarily an argument that therefore we should get rid of Sesame Street, but it does highlight the fact that in some cases, the rich get richer, so to speak, not in terms of only wealth, but also in terms of high performance. This particular picture gives you a visual of what the pre and post designs look like because we've randomly assigned the heights of these bars are kind of the same and the changes over the course of time are what gives us the magnitude of the experimental effect. If you want to get fancy, and generally speaking in our statistical analysis, we take into account this time one score when we're estimating the magnitude of change due to the effect. And so rather than doing something called analysis of variance, we do something called analysis of covariance. And this adjustment for your initial value is called a covariate. So what designs are better, pre and post 
or independent groups? Well, it does actually depend on your design. So earlier on when we were talking about the baby study, she was quite careful to note that babies are not patient creatures. You might not be able to do a pre-test and a post-test design. Sometimes when you expose people to the treatment, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can then expose them to another treatment later on. So sometimes there's some reaction that goes on. Post-test only designs can be really very powerful. I mean, if you have rapid access to a large number of people and you're you know, then restricting the amount of time, you can answer the questions that you need to answer. In other times, you know, say if you're looking at MRI research or if you're looking at brain other aspects of brain functioning or physiological functioning, a pre-post design works fairly well and because you it's really expensive to get people into the study. So you want to be able to only have very, very few people in the study. She talks about within groups designs, and here we have a lot of language. We talked about repeated measures designs. We'll get into that later on here. Concurrent measures designs. I'm not sure why she really wants to go into this. A concurrent design is no more or less, I'm going to give you more than one measure at one particular point in time. We'll talk about advantages of within groups designs and how we get at issues of covariance, temporal precedence, and internal validity when we are, have the opportunity to do a within groups designs. Within groups designs have their disadvantages. And one of the things that's a connection here is a pre-post design where we test people, expose them, and then test them again, does repeat measurement. But for reasons that we'll talk about, repeated measures designs are usually used to describe a slightly different state of affairs. So here's a repeated measures design. I have a group of people. I have them taste chocolate with a confederate. Tell me how good that chocolate is. And I tell them, here's another piece of chocolate. Tell me how good you think it is. But the confederate has left at this point, and we have them rate things. And we see here that the shared experience, the liking is higher than in the unshared experience. So as we talked about in class today, what's wrong with this? Well, it could be that this is just an artifact of time, that having eaten some chocolate and then turning around and eating some more chocolate, that chocolate is less enjoyed merely because you're a bit habituated to chocolate. You know, that's kind of why in my family, if I get a piece of pie, I eat one half. And I say, I'll eat the other half later because I know I'm going to enjoy it more later on. Our fix for this, in this you know, contrary argument to this, is to expose half of our subjects to this order and another half of our subjects to tasting chocolate alone at the beginning. Second topic, concurrent measures designs. So I've got a group of people, I expose them to a female face and a male face, and I have them to record which face they prefer to look at. Or other concurrent measures is I can have a group of people have them take more than one survey. Now, generally speaking, in a within group design, as I mentioned before, you've got smaller numbers of people. So if I want to assess 20 people in one condition and 20 groups in another, in a within groups design, they're the same 20 people. In a between groups design, I'd have to have 40 people. And analytically, you know, another advantage of this within groups design is it's the same person. So you know, maybe we want to look at people based on their ACT verbal score, fine. But that's only one measure. Having a within groups design lets me covary on the fact that, you know, whether you are male or not is an issue. Your ACT is or is not. When you got up that morning, how bored, how happy you are, all of those things are held constant in, by having the same person there. 
here she talks a bit about you know counterbalancing. That is, counterbalancing is a fancy word for changing up the order of things. And by virtue of having this particular design, we can now no longer say, oh, well, this is all an artifact of the fact that you had some chocolate and then turned around and had some more and maybe didn't like the second one as much. This design controls for that effect. It allows you to see whether that's an issue. It doesn't fix it. I mean, if it's the case that people just kind of fall off in terms of their ratings of chocolate, you can at least see it in this design and you might not have the test of the hypothesis is being with people or, or being alone a significant issue. Um, the other possibility, of course, is that maybe that's differential as a, as a result of the condition you were just in. When you have order effects, it's important to think about what those are. Sometimes they're practice effects. So if you're giving people little puzzles or little anagram problems to solve, after you've solved a couple of them, you go, oh yeah, I kind of know how this goes. So exposing people in a repeated measures design or in a concurrent measures design means that you need to think a little bit about that learning effect. In some studies, for example, we have people do a few things, a few practice exercises, and we throw that data away so that we can see the habituated, the actual performance. Carryover effects are another thing. So say, for example, you wanted to give people a measure of how depressed they are and a measure of how many friends they have. Well, if the first survey you take is about depression and the second one is about the number of friends you have, maybe there's a carryover effect. Thinking about depression, maybe you start thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe I don't really have all the friends I thought about. And secondly, you know, maybe there's a carryover effect in the other direction. Maybe being reminded or prompted about the friends you have would lead you to report that you are less depressed. So those types of carryover effects also argue for at least counterbalancing so you can see if that's a problem in your study. Counterbalancing is an issue. Well, full counterbalancing means I'm gonna take all the possible orders in the surveys that I have. So if, for example, I have four surveys, the number of possible counterbalancing groups I can have is four times three, 12 times two is 24. And that's an awful lot of groups. And as a result, we might do partial counterbalancing, a technique called the Latin square. Let me come in here and... A Latin square is nothing more than taking this first letter, this first condition I have, chopping it off and putting it on the end and repeating that process as many times as I have conditions. So if I have four tests, the Latin square would suggest four groups. And notice on this that the letter A, the, the first instrument I give, happens in the first, the fourth, the third, and the second times. It happens in each position. And similarly, the letter B, the second instrument I give, happens in each condition. And the same thing for C and the same thing for D. So, you know, if position is the only thing that's going to affect how things score, a Latin square is a useful way of looking at that. Now, in within groups designs, you could have order effects. And your solution sometimes is counterbalancing. You know, but if people are reactive to the particular order, that's an issue. Sometimes within groups aren't possible. As we mentioned, babies are not patient. You can't do a within groups design. And at times, if you show them your participants all levels of the independent variable, that kind of affects how they look at things. They may be trying to figure out what your study is about, and they might be inclined to try to give you the answers that you think you want, or there might be a response set. So you know, if you're being skeptical about whether a lithium groups design is there, these are some things to think about. <laughs>
Now, as I mentioned before, a pretest post-test design and a repeated measures design look similar in that you're administering your instrument a couple of times to people. Really, it's a matter of language and psychology. In a repeated measures design, we're talking about the focus being the measurement occasions. So if, for example, I do a study of MU college students assessed once a year for the first four years, I tend to think of that as a repeated measures design because we tend not to think of your freshman year as a pretest. And I'm interested in characterizing how things change over the course of time. Pretest measures are a, you know, have the advantage that they give you control over what that post test is going to look like. It's important to talk a little bit about this random assignment business versus matching. You know, in the random assignment of the pretest post test design, we flip a coin and we put you in the experimental, the control group. I could just as easily match. I could say, given the top two people on their ACT scores, I'm going to put one in treatment and one in control, and take the next two, put one in treatment and one in control. And in that way, I'm going to assure that there's less variation, less group difference on the pretest because I've matched. Well, why don't we do matching all the time? Well, it's kind of hard to do logistically. And often we want to match on more than one variable. Pre-test scores on the ACT, sex, size of the community you came from, for example. Well, and sometimes, you know, the game is not worth the candle. That when I'm looking at that, it turns out that it wasn't that important to match. So often random assignment is a simpler way to get to an experimental design. Just as with the bivariate experiment, we can also interrogate the causal claims, these four validities. So for memory, construct validity, external validity, statistical validity, and internal validity. So when we're talking about construct validity, how well were our variables measured and manipulated? Is the measure reliable? Is it, does it have convergent and divergent validity? Does it meet up with what we think this construct actually is? For our independent variables, how well did we manipulate them? And we try to put a little bit of information into our studies to inform that. Manipulation checks are one way. So sometimes you may do an experiment and they'll say, you know, read the following passage and answer a few questions on it as to how you feel about it. Well, before you do that, there's a question that says something like, and what was this bit of text about that you just got done reading? Because what we're trying to catch on is, did they actually read the material? Sometimes we might induce a mood. We might expose people to something to make them angry or frustrated. Well, the manipulation check there is, you know, asking them, so how frustrated are you feeling? And that tells us you know, again, were we effective in manipulating? It's also probably a good idea to do a few pilot studies. That is, give the survey out to a relatively small number of people before you do your full blown study. In our lab, for example, we might give our surveys out to graduate students. And it's really kind of a good way to look at that because when you're writing your own study, you kind of lose sight of what it's like to read this material for the first time and be exposed to it. In your own life, you may have observed that maybe some of these studies take longer than they thought they would, than they said they would. Probably this is due to the fact that it's taking us, as people who are exposed to the study in the first time, a bit longer to read through this material than someone else who's been spending the past four or five months designing the study. Construct validity is, you know, in addition to being a study of, you know, how well was it measured and manipulated, also has a role within theory testing. So in light of the variables we're looking at, how does this relate to the web of belief, if you will, 
of the larger research knowledge base that we have about this. It doesn't mean that your study has to conform with what's going on, but it is comforting to know this has some interpretation within a larger context. Theory testing with respect to a larger body of work also tells us you know, some fruitful avenues for maybe third variable explanations or alternative explanations for the study that we might have. External validity, when can this generalize? When does it not generalize? So if you're thinking about your words from the earlier chapters, when we do not have external validity, it's kind of like a moderator effect. In other words, the magnitude of an association for men might be different than for women. Does this generalize to other situations? This is a big issue in lab studies. A lab situation is kind of an artificial environment. Can we really believe that the behaviors that people exhibit in a lab situation will generalize to the real life? Now, external validity is certainly important in understanding how our theories, how our data might not generalize to populations of people who are older poorer or richer than we are, different ethnic groups or different family situations. Sometimes external validity is not the be all and end all though. And we do an awful lot of studies with college students. Is this really something that's gonna generalize to a 30 year old? Hmm, I don't know. And one of the ways that the book and psychologists in general think about this is that we're interested in a relationship between one construct and another. So although it's important to appreciate the limitations of a study, you know, can this be generalized? And when you write a limitation section, you mention that, you can still make the case scientifically that there remains some kind of association there. Statistical validity has to do with the numbers game. And as someone who teaches stat, I mean, this is kind of something that I find important and kind of pretty easy to think about. As you're looking at the validity, how large is the effect? Sometimes things might be statistically significant, but it's a teeny tiny effect. Is it practically something more than decimal dust? When we're looking at our data and we calculate a statistic like a mean, we have a mean for one group and mean for another group, that statistic called the standard error of the mean is a guess about what the standard deviation is of this particular statistic if I were to turn around and do the study again. So the standard error of the estimate figures in calculation of the confidence interval. So in this particular case, we have a mean and we see a confidence interval going on here. Statistical validity also comes to the fore when we're thinking about has our study been replicated? And you might say, well, that's a little silly because after all, you just got done telling me that the confidence interval relies on the standard error and the standard error is an estimate of how much these numbers are gonna jump around if I do the study again. But replication in the real world usually means you're looking at a slightly different population, a slightly different time, a slightly different research group that's doing it. And to the extent that those things could affect the data, replicating the study can be a valuable thing. Internal validity is kind of my favorite part because there you get to play a little bit of a lawyer game and think, does this really make the case that you think it does? Are there some design confounds? In the case of the chocolate example, you know, is the fact that you're having chocolate once and chocolate again, is that really what's at play when you observe mean differences between the two conditions? If you have an independent design, did you control for selection effects using random assignment or matching? If you just go out and say, who wants to be in this study and who wants to be in that condition? Maybe people will sign up for one condition versus another by virtue of how attractive it is. If you randomly assign people or if you match them, 
we have much more confidence that if people in one treatment condition are in some sense comparable to people in the other condition, and that mean differences are actually not a function of participant selection. Selection effect is a big deal, though, if you're asking people to do something like abstain from alcohol or tobacco or drugs or not engage in risky sex. And, you know, going into a treatment program, the attractiveness of a given treatment to people and the fact that maybe some people will drop out and therefore bias your means is an important thing to consider. Okay, this is a somewhat abbreviated lecture that I have. Take a look at the PowerPoint, and if you have any questions, please let me know.